Hey everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we're gonna to teach you how to play Tiny Epic Dungeons. Now, while I'm filming this video, you may occasionally hear a dog whining in the background. Our puppy recently had a procedure done and has to be secluded from the other dog so they don't tear his stitches. And so he's a little upset about that. So if you hear a dog whining, that's what's going on there. I also want to mention our sponsor, StoneValleyGames.com, which is run by Eric and Wendy, a married couple. Eric spent over 25 years in the U.S. Army, and during that time, he spent a lot of time solo gaming, and so StoneValleyGames.com does have a uh, focus on solo gaming, but that's not all they do. They also have the new hotness. They've got a lot of old classics. They have Magic the Gathering, a whole bunch of those type of games as well. There's a ton of great stuff over there. Be sure to check them out. There's a link in the description below. They also have a loyalty program for return customers, so that's a great way for you to kind of get involved with them over there. And to support the military, if you have an AA, AE, or AP address, they will ship for free to any of those addresses. So be sure to go check out StoneValleyGames.com. The link is in the description below. And without anything else, let's get down to the table and I'm gonna teach you Tiny Epic Dungeons. Throughout this instructional video for Tiny Epic Dungeons, I'll be using these player mats and this game board mat to help with my own organization. These are, do not come with the base game and are separate purchases. To begin the setup, you'll need to separate out the different types of dungeon deck cards. The entrance has this symbol. The various rooms have this symbol in the top left corner. The encounters have this symbol. And the layer door card has this symbol. Shuffle the room deck, and then draw a number of cards from this deck based on the number of heroes. If you have two heroes, it'll be nine cards. Three heroes will be seven. Four heroes will be five cards. Let's say we're setting up for a two-hero game, so we'll draw nine cards. And we'll set these right here for the moment. This will be known as deck A. Next, take the encounter cards, shuffle them up, and then draw one encounter card per hero. So in this case, two. You can place the rest back in the box. And then draw three cards per hero from the rest of the room deck. So six. Shuffle the two encounter cards and the six room cards. This is deck B. Next, draw three more cards from the room deck and shuffle them with the layer entrance. This is deck C. Finally, you'll stack B on top of C and A on top of B. Do not shuffle this combined deck. This is now your dungeon deck. All remaining room cards can go back in the box. The entrance card is then placed in the center of the table. Then draw four cards from the dungeon deck and place them on all four sides of the entrance. Make sure they're face down. If you don't have the player mat, make sure you leave enough room for a 7x7 grid, as this will be the maximum size the dungeon will become. Place an altar marker on its matching symbol right here. Keep an additional number of altar markers equal to the number of players nearby. Place the torch mat on the table, making sure that Act 1 is face up. If you're playing without the player mat, make sure you leave space around the torch mat for the four goblins that could come out as well as for the minion. Place the torch marker on the space matching the number of heroes. So you can see that's two heroes here. If it was three heroes, it would be here, and four heroes, it would be here. Shuffle the goblin deck and place it nearby, and do the same with the minion deck. Place the goblin tokens on their matching numbers on the torch mat, or if using the player mat, you can place them here. Place these gray enemy health markers equal to the number of heroes near the minion deck. Take all the boss mats and shuffle them face down. Draw one without looking at it and place it near the grid. All unused boss mats can be returned to the box. Place the boss token near the boss mat. Shuffle the loot deck and place it nearby. And the spell deck and place it nearby. Deal out the Hero mats, the players can choose these or they can be dealt out randomly. Each player places their mini on the entrance. Each player gets one health marker and one focus marker 
placing them on the tracks on their hero mat, always at the highest numbered space. Keep these disarm markers nearby, as well as the three hero dice and one enemy die, and then the youngest player takes the first turn. The game consists of two acts. During the first act, the players will be trying to locate the boss, and during the second act, they will be trying to defeat the boss. Players win by defeating the boss in act two, or they lose in one of three different ways. If all four goblins are out in the dungeon and a fifth should be placed, then players will lose. If the torch reaches the skull at the end of the torch mat, players lose. Or if the dungeon has been explored to the point where no more dungeon cards can be revealed and the layer door has not yet been revealed. Now let's discuss hero attributes for a moment. A hero's health tracks the amount of damage they suffer in the dungeon. If a hero's health should ever go below one, then it is placed on zero and their hero falls unconscious. Focus is used to perform special actions with your hero, loot or rooms in the dungeon, or to adjust a die roll. If you ever go below one focus, place the marker on zero and there is no further negative effect. It just limits your abilities until you get more focus. Hero's speed is the maximum number of rooms they may move in a turn, in this case three. And their defense is the amount of damage they can negate from an enemy counterattack, in this case five. Strength, agility, and intellect are used for skill checks. Your, profic your proficiency with each is indicated by the number of cubes shown next to it, representing how many dice you roll for a check. So for a strength check, this elf warlock would roll two dice. You may never have more than three dice for any skill or less than one. Even loot and spells cannot provide a fourth die to any check. On your turn, your hero may perform any or all of the following actions in any order. However, none are mandatory. They may move, they may perform one heroic action, or they may perform any number of free actions. At the end of your turn, even if you did nothing, the torch must move down one space and then you must resolve any effect on the space on which the torch lands. After that, it is the next player's turn in clockwise order. So now let's discuss movement. Your speed determines how far you may move. As we mentioned, the warlock has a speed of three. Pathways are formed when two corridors on dungeon cards connect. Starting in this first room, there are four corridors here, 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 and here. Movement is always along a corridor and a hero may move into and explore an unexplored room, or they may move into a previously explored room. If you perform a heroic action before your movement is over, that heroic action ends your movement. However, free actions may be performed at any time and do not end your movement. Let's say for a moment that the board was set up like this and there was a goblin in this room. Moving into a room with an enemy ends your movement. The only time a hero can move through enemies is if they have the stealth ability. Heroes, on the other hand, have no effect on another hero's movement. Now in this case, I had this marker here showing that the trap had been disarmed. If it is not disarmed, when a hero enters a room with a trap, they must check for danger. But as long as the trap has been disarmed, the hero ignores its negative effects and does not need to perform any skill check. We'll be discussing traps in more detail shortly. Heroes may perform a free action on a portal, as indicated by these symbols, to spend two focus and teleport to any revealed dungeon card. This may come during your movement since it's a free action. However, you cannot teleport out of a room if an enemy would prevent you from moving. Also, a portal can be used to teleport directly to a revealed layer door card, but it may not be used to teleport directly onto the boss mat. Now let's discuss revealing new dungeon rooms. If there is a face down dungeon card next to your room on your turn, when you move, you may spend one speed to flip that card and then move into it. After flipping the card, it may be rotated to any side as long as a pathway between it and the room you're coming from is created. So this is perfectly fine. However, this side would not be okay. Once you've oriented it the way you want it, Check to see if there's any other pathways leading from the room. And if so, place a face down dungeon tile 
next to those pathways. These are future rooms that can be revealed. If there are no cards left in the dungeon deck, then you can ignore that step though. Then you must move into the new room and check for danger. However, it should be noted that rooms with this symbol right here indicate that the player is not required to move into that room after revealing it. Always keep in mind that the dungeon may never extend more than three cards from the center, which will create a seven by seven grid. For this reason, players should be careful how they orient the different rooms, since it is possible that players could back themselves into a corner with no new room able to be revealed and the layer door not yet revealed either. In that case, players lose. When moving into a new room, if the new room has this symbol, it means there's a trap. This symbol means a goblin, and this symbol means a minion. In any of these cases, the player now must check for danger. When a goblin encounter is resolved, if you are in the room, take one damage, and your movement ends for the turn. Then, draw a card from the top of the goblin deck, and place it face up in the lowest unoccupied goblin slot. Now, obviously, if you don't have the player mat, that would be here. Place the goblin that matches that slot in the newly revealed room. Normally, you can have them standing up, but just because of the angle of the camera, I'm laying them down for ease of viewing. If there were no cards left in the goblin deck, you would shuffle the discard pile to create a new deck and then draw from that. If four goblins are currently in the dungeon and a fifth one needs to be drawn, the players lose. If you are in the room for a minion encounter, your hero takes two damage and your movement ends for the turn. Draw a card from the minion deck and place it face up to the right of the torch mat. If an additional minion needs to be drawn at any point and this one is still out, it will be placed to the right of that one. Place an enemy health marker on the highest numbered space on the card's track. Then place the minion's matching token in the room. Unlike goblin and minion encounters, traps resolve every time a hero enters the room as long as it has not been disarmed. The hero must evade by immediately performing the trap's skill check listed here. If the check is successful, there is no effect, but if you fail, trigger the trap and take the amount of damage shown in the X box. After resolving the skill check, regardless of if you succeeded or failed, you may continue your movement or attempt to disarm the trap. After revealing a new dungeon room, as long as nothing has ended your movement, you may continue to move and possibly explore additional rooms. You may continue to do this until you run out of speed or you have an enemy encounter. Anytime you see this blue icon, whether it's on a room, on your hero card, or anywhere else, that is referring to a heroic action. On your turn, you may perform one heroic action. Most of the time, this will require a skill check. Anytime a skill icon is pointing to a number, a skill check must be performed to attempt that action. In this case, you can see you need an intellect skill check of five. So to succeed at this skill check, your result must meet or exceed five. Then the green check mark shows what happens if you succeed, and the X shows what happens if you fail. In some cases, there is no red X, in which case there is no penalty for failing. After succeeding, if the green checkbox has a cost, you must be able to pay that cost in order to gain the box's effect. In this case, there is no cost. However, in this one, you can see you must be able to pay four focus to then move the torch up two spaces. If you cannot pay the cost, there is no effect. The number of dice rolled is determined on your hero mat. For intellect, you can see the warlock is gonna roll three dice. You may never roll more than three nor less than one die when performing a skill check. After rolling, select a single die for the skill check to determine success or failure. The hero dice have faces numbered one through six with one and two also having a plus symbol. These two lowest die results may be used to modify the result, increasing the check's final result. A plus die may also be used as the result with its basic value of one or two. In this case, we need a five, so this five would do it. But let's say we'd only roll two dice, and so we only had this three and a plus two. We could use three plus two for five and also pass the check. You'll also notice that some of the faces, faces one through four, have these focus icons on them. After rolling a successful skill check, 
any unused dice for that check's results may be used to increase your focus. You'll also notice that faces one through four have these focus symbols on them. After rolling a successful skill check, any unused dice for the check's result may be used to increase your focus. So if the five is used, that leaves four focus symbols left over that are not used, and so your focus will increase by four. It's important to note that focus from unused dice can only be added to your total after you have resolved a successful skill check. It should also be noted that face six has a heart instead of a focus symbol. After resolving a check, gain one health for each unused six die. It should also be noted that certain skill checks have modifier symbols next to them. In this case, when the warlock uses the dagger, they'll actually subtract one from their final result, making it more difficult for him to pass this check. So let's discuss the types of heroic actions. All heroes can rest, as indicated by this symbol here. When you rest, immediately gain three health and five focus. If your hero is unconscious at the start of your turn, you must rest, after which you may move, and then your turn is over. Some rooms, such as this one, have a special feature on them, such as a chest to open, a lever to pull, or a witch's brew in need of tasting. While in that room, you may search, usually by performing a skill check or by paying a cost. Sometimes failing a check results in a goblin encounter or other negative effects. In this case, it would cause the torch to move forward one space. You may not perform a search if there is an enemy in the room unless there is at least one other conscious hero present in the room with you. After you've performed the trap's evasion skill check, you may attempt to disarm it by resolving the check on the right side, here. You cannot perform a disarm if there are enemies in the same room unless there is another conscious hero present. If you do successfully disarm the trap, place the disarm token in that room. Heroes entering this room now ignore the evasion skill check for the rest of the game. Also, as a reward, get either one loot or one spell, as indicated by this symbol here. Once disarmed, a trap may never be armed again. If you fail a disarm check, there is no negative effect. Some spells deal damage, some heal, and others grant special abilities to heroes. To cast a spell, the targets of the spell must be within the listed range, shown here. You must perform the skill check listed for the spell, meeting or exceeding its number as usual. If the check is successful, any focus from unused dice is gained immediately and can be used to perform the spell's effect. So, if this were what the Warlock rolled when trying to cast Fireball, he would use the 5 plus 2 to get the 7 needed to succeed at the check, and then would gain this one focus, and then would have to spend 6 focus to cast it. The Warlock would then deal 4 damage to the target. It's important to remember that when casting spells, focus from unused dice is gained first, not after. Attacks are heroic actions that can be found on your hero's mat, on loot, spells, and on equipment. They can be used to perform attack actions against enemies. There are three types of attacks. Melee, Missile, and Spell. Melee attacks must target an enemy in the same room. Missile attacks must target an enemy that is in another room in line of sight of the hero with its listed range. The enemy may not be in the same room as the hero. Spell attacks target enemy within the listed range of the spell, including in the same room. Spell damage ignores the enemy's defense, dealing direct damage. Anytime you are attacking an enemy in the same room or an enemy within line of sight, not only will you roll the normal amount of hero dice, you will also roll the enemy die. Melee and missile attacks require a skill check against the enemy's defense. The weapon you use determines which skill is needed. So to use the Warlock's Dagger, you would need to use Strength. To use the Great Staff of the Phoenix, you would need to use Intellect. Strength is typical for melee, and Agility is typical for Missile, but some weapons will be different, as you see here. To deal damage to the enemy, the check's result must be higher than the enemy's defense. 
It should also be noted that certain minions have a bonus defense against certain types of attacks. For instance, the Minotaur has a plus two defense bonus against melee attacks. If successful in your roll, deal damage to the enemy equal to the difference between the results total with all modifiers and the enemy's defense. So in this case, six plus two, that's eight total. Minus one, because when the Warlock uses his dagger, he gets minus one to the roll, so that's seven. The Minotaur has four defense plus two against melee attacks, so that's six. So the difference is one. So the Minotaur would lose one health. Every time damage is dealt to an enemy, check to see if it is killed. We'll discuss that more shortly. If your check against the enemy's defense fails, then no damage is dealt. There are five different symbols that you need to know dealing with range. This symbol indicates the target must be in the same room. This symbol indicates the target must be within line of sight, and the number next to it indicates how many rooms away. With this symbol, the target can never be in the same room. This symbol indicates the target must be within the listed number of rooms, in this case two, following a pathway or in the same room as you. In this case, line of sight is not required. This symbol indicates all heroes within the listed range of rooms, in this case four, and this is the same but for enemies. In both of those last two cases, the target may be in the same room and does not require a line of sight, but as usual, the spell must follow the pathways from the attacker. It should also be noted that heroes and enemies do not block or obstruct any form of attack. If the enemy you attacked is still alive and is in the same room or line of sight of you after the attack, then that enemy counterattacks. Use the result of the enemy die you rolled during the check. On a result of 2 through 5, the enemy attacks with this number plus the enemy modifier listed on the enemy's card. In this case, for either missile or spell attacks, it gets plus 2 for a total of 7. If the enemy rolled this shield match symbol, the die equals your defense, including all of your defense modifiers. And so basically this means that it will deal damage equal to the enemy modifier. Again, in this case, two. If the torch is rolled, this is considered a miss for the enemy. You do not take any damage, but the torch moves one space down the track. All enemies have a modifier that adds to the enemy die based on the type of attack the hero uses. Minions each have different modifiers for melee attacks and missile or spell attacks. While goblins have the same modifier for all three types of attacks, and it's always the number of goblins currently in the dungeon. Bosses also have modifiers listed for each type of attack. After totaling the result for the counterattack, check if the hero takes damage. Compare the enemy's total to the hero's defense, including all modifiers. If the enemy's total is higher, subtract the hero's defense from the enemy's attack and deal that much damage to the hero. In this case, 5 plus the 2 that the dungeon crawler receives for spell and missile attacks equals 7, so 7 minus 5 is 2. The warlock takes 2 damage. It should be noted that if the hero used an attack that targets multiple enemies and multiple could counterattack, only one of them will counterattack, and the player gets to choose which one. If an enemy is reduced to zero health, it's killed, and so it does not perform its counterattack. Minions track their health on their card, and when it reaches zero, it dies. Remove its token and minion card from the play area. Place its health marker on the boss mat for the number of heroes currently being used. The heroes are now one step closer to opening the layer door. As a reward, you may choose to take one spell or one loot, and then choose again to take one spell or one loot for a total of two. You may also move the torch up six spaces, but not past the space that it originally started on. A goblin always has only one health, so if it's dealt one or more damage, it's dead. Its token is returned to its appropriate number, and its card is discarded to the goblin discard pile. The reward for killing a goblin is always listed here on the card. Loot is always one of the options, but there may be something else as well. In this case, the hero can gain three health. 
And remember, anytime you see this slash, it means that you must make a choice. In this case, either gain loot or gain three health, as opposed to this goblin where you gain loot and three health. Bosses have special rules for how they take damage and how their multiple health markers will move down this track, and we'll cover all that in a little bit. If your health is ever reduced to zero or below, then you have fallen unconscious and your turn ends. Lay your mini on its side. Then on your next turn, you must perform the rest action, as we've discussed, to become conscious, in which case your mini stands back up. And then after you rest, since it is a heroic action, you can move and then your turn is over. However, unlike normal, in this case, you cannot even perform free actions if you started your turn unconscious. Other heroes may perform healing spells or abilities to heal an unconscious hero, which then immediately causes the hero to stand back up. During your turn, you may perform as many free actions as you want at any time. Free actions are always indicated by an orange plaque. They can be performed in between movement, before or after your heroic action, or before or after dice are rolled. However, you can only perform free actions on your turn, not on another hero's turn. We're not gonna run through all the free actions you might run into, but let's talk about a few that are commonly encountered. This free action allows the player to spend two focus to roll the die up or down one notch. You can do this as many times as you can afford. However, the die may never be modified above six or below one, and you cannot go around the corner, meaning you cannot change it from six to a one or vice versa. The free action on the layer door card allows the player to enter the boss's layer. However, this can only be done once the player has killed the number of minions required for the number of heroes playing. Also, even though this is a free action, the hero still must spend one movement to move from the layer door into the actual layer. The hero may reveal adjacent unexplored rooms for a free action by moving the torch down one space on the torch mat and then revealing all rooms immediately adjacent to the room they're currently in. If this reveals any goblins or minions, those tokens and cards are added to their respective rooms, but the hero does not lose health. For the research free action, the hero spends four focus to either discover a new spell by drawing it from the spell deck, or taking a face-up spell from the spell discard row. Keep in mind that if research has been covered up by a loot card, it cannot be used. Trigger abilities, while considered free actions, do not have an orange plaque marking them. Such as Battle Rage right here, there will be a heroic action that is modified by something after it. This modification is considered a free action and happens at the same time as the heroic action. In this case, when making a melee or missile attack, the half-orc barbarian can spend three focus to add plus two to the roll. The torch represents your fight against the darkness. If the torch ever reaches the final skull on the mat, you lose and the game is over. Some effects will move the torch back up the track, but it can never move beyond the initial starting space. Anytime the torch is moving down the track and it lands on one of these spaces, an effect is triggered. It's important to keep in mind that when the torch is moving up the track, this is not the same. It does not trigger any of these effects on the way up. This symbol means that when the torch moves onto it, you need to add a goblin to the entrance. Place the lowest numbered goblin on the entrance tile and then draw a goblin card and place in its slot. As a reminder, if a fifth goblin should ever be placed, the game is over and you lose. This symbol means that all enemies in the dungeon will trigger their action. Each enemy has an action listed next to this icon. Keep in mind that these actions never attack unconscious heroes. Also, a hero's defense or abilities cannot block this damage. It is direct damage. Goblins will resolve first in order from 1 to 4. It's also important to note on goblin cards if they move and attack or if they move or attack. Then minions will resolve from left to right. Keep in mind minions are only out in Act 1. If it's Act 2, then the boss will resolve their action. 
Minions and bosses will always move and attack. For a move or attack action, first check to see if there are heroes within range for each goblin attack. If so, the goblin will immediately attack and not move. In this case, that's what would happen. With move and attack, first check if the nearest conscious hero to the enemy is in its room. If so, the enemy will immediately attack and will not move. If not, the enemy will move and then it will attack. When enemies move, they target the closest conscious hero and then move their speed following the shortest pathway. In this case, the warlock is definitely closer than the adventurer. And so, the goblin will move here. If multiple heroes could be chosen, as you see here, they're both exactly the same distance away, then the active player chooses which hero the goblin moves to. If there are no conscious heroes, then enemies will not move. Enemies will move up to their speed, but they'll stop in the first room with a conscious hero. Enemies are unaffected by other enemies or traps, but they can never walk through walls. And if there happen to be multiple pathways tied for the shortest route, the enemy can walk through either pathway the active player chooses. To defeat stronger enemies, you will need more and more powerful loot and spells. You can find these items in the dungeon by searching rooms, disarming traps, and defeating enemies. Loot is found in three forms, hand, garb, and trinket. Spells are all the same form. Anytime you are awarded the full color icon of loot or spells, this means you can draw from the deck or from the appropriate face-up discard row. When drawing a loot or a spell, you decide to either keep it or discard it face up in its discard row. Sometimes these symbols will be grayed out as you see here. This means you must select from the discard row. Anytime a loot or spell card is discarded, it is placed in the discard row face up. The gray icon that I just showed you will never allow you to draw from the top of the deck. Loot and spells may only be equipped when you are resolving a discover or pickup effect. On the other hand, you can always discard them from your mat as a free action on your turn. Remember to place it in the appropriate discard row. You may never give that card directly to another hero, however. Equipping loot will cover one of your starting items or abilities. Discarding that loot will allow that starting item or ability to be used once again. It should be noted there are limits to how many loot and spell cards your hero can have at one time. They may have two hands worth of loot, one garb, two trinkets, and two spells. All of this is noted on your hero mat. Some loot are parts of legendary sets that have been separated and reuniting them unlocks their full power. An animal icon is in the lower left corner of these cards. Next to that is its ability as these powers are unlocked. There's no set bonus for having just one item of a set, but as you can see here, the moment you have two, there is a bonus. And then when you have three, the bonus increases, and the fourth one gives you the maximum bonus. Once the layer door is revealed and all minions have been defeated, the door is unlocked and the heroes can now enter the fight with the boss. When any hero performs the enter the boss's layer free action at a layer door card, immediately flip the boss mat to the act two side. which reveals the boss. Stack all health markers from the minions on top of each other at the maximum health for the boss. These markers represent the boss's health. Place the boss token on the boss mat to show that the boss's current location is in the lair. Flip the torch mat to the act two side and place the torch on the starting space for the current number of heroes. The act two side of the torch mat will be used for the rest of the game. If there were any goblin cards on the torch mat because you're not using the player mat, make sure they are still aligned with the same position. Place an altar marker on each of these symbols, which we found on each of the minion encounter rooms. In Act 2, your goal is to reduce all of the boss's health markers to zero. 
However, damaging the boss with weapons and spells will not be enough. The heroes must draw the boss out of its lair to the various altars. This will dispel the wards that protect the boss. You must spend one movement on your turn to enter the boss mat from the lair door card. The boss mat is considered one large room. All forms of attack and range are allowed. All heroes and enemies are both in the same room and in line of sight. The room has six hero spaces. These are marked with hero icons, as you can see. These hero spaces are where you can stand to make attacks against the boss. The space with the black arrows is the entrance space. This is the space that you must enter on first when you come from the lair door card. You can then use any remaining movement after entering to move to adjacent hero spaces. Some spaces are marked with modifiers or additional effects that affect the actions that you perform. You can move past other heroes on spaces, but you cannot be in the same space as another hero once the movement is complete. If a hero only has one movement remaining to move onto the boss mat card, but there is a hero on the entrance space, then that hero cannot enter the card this turn. Just like entering the boss mat, you must be on the black arrows to leave and go back to the layer door card. Some hero spaces have additional effects on them. These only take place when the hero ends their movement on those spaces. And those types of effects do not trigger if a hero begins their turn on the space. Even with the boss mat revealed, goblins will continue to appear in the dungeon as normal and move and attack as normal. Goblins can even enter the boss's lair, and if so, they are placed in the center of the mat and can be attacked by you and can attack you. They target all heroes in the lair with their enemy action and can be attacked by any hero in the lair. You choose, when attacking, to target either the boss or the goblin. While on the boss mat, heroes must be standing on hero spaces to attack the boss, where all attacks of any sort are considered in range. As we mentioned, keep in mind the modifiers that the spaces show. When the boss is in the dungeon and not on the boss mat, heroes can attack it as if it were any other enemy. The boss's health track operates differently than minions or hero tracks do. It has multiple markers, one for each minion that was in the dungeon. And the goal is to get all of the health markers to zero. When applying damage, one marker can be moved the full amount of damage or the damage can be spread across multiple markers. Health markers cannot move onto or past a track space marked with an altar icon, seen here, unless there is an altar marker placed there. So if the boss was just dealt six damage, we could apply it like this, one, two, three, four, five, but the sixth damage could not be applied because there is no altar marker on the altar icon. The boss will absorb any damage, including partial damage, to reach that threshold, but is not hurt by any remaining damage that would match or pass an uncovered altar space. This is because the boss has wards protecting it from damage. To dispel these altars, the heroes must force the boss to move to altars in the dungeon. As soon as the boss token enters a room with an altar, remove the altar marker from the card and place it on the highest uncovered altar icon on the boss's card. Health markers are no longer stopped at this point on the track. They can move onto or past it when more damage is dealt. In order to bring the boss to altars, heroes will have to leave the boss layer card. The boss on its turn will move first from the layer card to the layer door card and then towards the nearest conscious hero. In this way, heroes can bait the boss to altars. On their turn, heroes can also spend two focus to taunt the boss. This is a free action. When doing this free action, the boss is moved up to its speed towards the hero taunting it. The pharaoh has two speed, and so if the adventurer was taunting it, it would move one, two. Always follow normal movement rules through pathways for enemies, but you are the boss's target. It will ignore every other hero except for you. And this action can be used as many times as you have focus to spend, just like any other free action. When you attack the boss, it nearly always will be able to counterattack. It should be noted that on the boss mat are different enemy dive modifiers for each type of attack. Sometimes a modifier may show lose focus or lose health. This effect happens after the hero resolves the attack. There's also a special instance for the torch die result when used by the boss. 
If moving the torch also causes an enemy action, then resolve the torch's die effect first. It should be noted that any attack the boss makes while in the boss lair will only affect heroes in the boss lair and not any heroes in the dungeon. The opposite is also true. If the boss is in the dungeon, it cannot attack heroes in the lair. Also, while the boss is in its lair, heroes in the dungeon cannot use missile and spell attacks against it, and vice versa. It is possible to play Tiny Epic Dungeon solo with absolutely no rule changes. The only thing is you must use at least two heroes, though you certainly could use three or even four. Regardless of how many players are participating, the number of heroes used is the player count. Finally, I have to mention that there is an absurd amount of iconography in this game, and this player aid that I found on BoardGameGeek has been incredibly useful in saving me a lot of headaches trying to decipher a lot of this iconography. I'll put a link to where you can find this player aid in the description below. And that's how you play Tiny Epic Dungeons. Be sure to come back for more great instructional videos coming up. We've got Waste Nights coming up. We've got, let's see, what else? Uh, Australia is coming up. I'm scripting Dungeon Universalis right now. Lots of great things coming, so be sure to come back. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.